All right. Well, hi there, everybody, and thanks for joining in to our presentation on options fundamentals. My name is Jason Ayers. I am a derivatives market specialist by designation. I'm uh, also the director of business development uh, and a derivative strategist with RN Croft Financial Group. Um, with the uh, Croft Financial Group, I'm also a member of the Investment Review Committee and sit on the board of directors. In addition to that, uh, I'm an educational consultant for LearnToTradeGlobal.com and a leading instructor for the TMX Montreal Exchange. As always, we just want to make sure that everybody understands that the information that we're going to be presenting here today is for educational purposes only. Always want to recognize that regardless of what type of financial security uh, you are trading or investing in, there are always or there is always the potential for um, risk and loss. And so uh, you just want to make sure that you understand those risks before you actually trade and invest in your live portfolio. So uh, as mentioned, today we're going to cover um, an introduction to options. Uh, we're going to first take a look at what an option is. Uh, we'll review an options chain and uh, the uh, different characteristics of how um, an options contract is presented. We'll talk about uh, pricing variables and uh, options premium or how options are priced. We'll talk about um, intrinsic and time value, which are the two different components that uh, make up an options premium. And then we'll discuss some um, exercise and assignment. So first of all, what is an option? Well, the options uh, world uh, belongs to or the option or options themselves uh, belong to what's referred to as a derivatives market. And so that's a very, very broad based market. It includes a lot of different uh, types of financial uh, securities. Um, but basically a derivative um, is any financial instrument that acquires its value from an underlying security. So um, for an options contract, uh, we want to recognize that um, each contract represents rights and obligations. So two types of contracts that you could be um, utilizing. One would be a call option. Uh, the other would be a put option. And again, uh, each contract represents a specific set of rights and obligations that are dependent on um, which type is chosen. So whether or not you choose a call or a put option um, and uh, whether or not you are a buyer or a seller uh, of the contract. So each uh, contract controls 100 shares. So it's important to recognize that um, that equity and exchange traded fund options are standardized. So these are standardized characteristics of, of those types of contracts. So one contract controls 100 shares. When you're looking at how a um, uh, an option contract is displayed, you want to recognize that it's displayed on a per, sh per share basis. Uh, and so um, what that means is that because each contract controls 100 shares of the underlying security, you would need to multiply the premium that is uh, being presented to you um, by the um, by 100. So in other words, if uh, the contract is quoted at uh, 1.25, so $1.25 per contract, uh, when you multiply that by 100, you get, of course, $125 per contract. So let's take a closer look at, um, at a call option. So again, there's two sides to every transaction, uh, not unlike any financial security. So as the call option buyer, you're going to pay a premium for the right to buy or purchase the underlying shares at a specific price for a specific period of time. So again, that, that right to buy is um, only valid for a specific period of time. Now, on the other side of the transaction, there is a call option seller, or we sometimes refer to them as a call option writer, and they actually get paid uh, for taking on an obligation to sell you the underlying securities again for the price specified within the contract, and that obligation is uh, valid or um, in place for a specific period of time. Again, when we're referring to the specific price and the specific time, all of those details are, are identified within the contract that is being bought or sold. And we'll take a closer look at that uh, in a couple of minutes here. So uh, let's take a look at a, uh, an example of how a call options transaction may work. So here we have Jackie, for example. Uh, Jackie's gonna be our call option buyer. And 
she believes that ABC Corp is going to go up in value. Now, she doesn't own the stock yet, and she's looking for a way that she can actually participate in the continued upside opportunity, um, but, manage, uh, that, but manage her risk uh, more effectively. Now, on the other side of it, we have Peter, who um, is going to be our call option seller or our call writer. Now, Peter owns ABC shares and believes there's only a limited upside to the stock on the short term. And because of this belief, he's looking to enhance um, the income that he's generating on the stock. So here we have an example of two different investors, um, both looking to utilize the same call option, but for different objectives. One uh, wants to participate in, a, in, in the upside opportunity and, and wants to buy the call option as a stock replacement strategy. The other is looking to generate some cash flow off of owning the shares and is prepared to give those shares up uh, at a certain price um, for the premium that, uh, that they're able to collect. So once again, what happens is these two different investors um, will come together within the market and enter into this contract where one has the right in the case of the call buyer and the other has an obligation in the case of the call seller. So if we take a little uh, closer look at the, um, at the logistics of this uh, relationship here, let's, let's look at ABC trading at $105. Now, um, when you go to the options market, um, there is the potential to purchase uh, a, an option contract that is valid for one month and that um, has a strike price of $105. So in other words, the um, call will expire in a month and the rights and obligations associated with that call um, is set at $105. So when the underlying shares um, are at or above $105, that's where the call buyer has the right to own the shares, and that's where the call writer has the obligation to deliver the shares. Now, this contract is uh, valued at $1.40, but of course, when we multiply that by 100, which is the standardized um, number of underlying shares that each contract represents, um, it's worth $140. So in this case, Jackie, as the call option buyer, pays $140 for the call and has the right to own the shares at $105, Peter receives $140 for that contract as income and has an obligation to deliver the shares at $105 um, within the life cycle of this particular contract. Now, when it comes to put options, um, once again, there's the buyer and the seller. The buyer has a right. The seller has an obligation. But in this case, it's going to be a little different. So the put option buyer pays a premium and secures the right to sell the underlying security at a specific price. And that right is valid for a specific time. Now, on the other side of the transaction, the put option writer or the put option seller is going to receive that premium and take on an obligation to buy the underlying securities security at the defined price. And again, that obligation is valid for that specific period of time. So to take a closer look at um, the logistics of this relationship here, let's look at Doug as being our put option buyer. Now, um, Doug is bearish on XYZ Incorporated, so Doug believes that the shares are going to drop in value. Um, now, not having a position in the stock currently, uh, Doug's actually looking for a way to participate on a um, drop uh, in the underlying shares. So a way that you can participate is um, in a bearish opportunity is to purchase a put option. As the shares go down in value, the put option will go up in value and subsequently Doug the put buyer is able to benefit from that bearish outlook. So again, Doug is going to um, buy the put and pay a premium. And Amy on the other side of this transaction um, Amy likes uh, the, um, the uh, stock, believes that there's only a limited downside risk to the stock in the short term and wants to generate some, some income. So in other words, what Jackie's looking to do is sell the put, take on the obligation to buy the shares, but get paid for doing so. And as the shares drop in value, um, then Amy um, has the uh, the, the obligation to purchase the shares at the agreed upon strike and is getting paid the premium in order to do so. 
So when we look at how um, uh, this all works out from a, um, you know, from a, a transactional perspective, if we look at XYZ trading at $22, the one month 22 strike put is trading at 20 cents. Now, what that means is that the, um, the contract is valid for one month. The strike price, so the price at which the call buyer, or sorry, the put buyer has the right and the put seller has the obligation, is um, at $22. And um, the premium associated with that is $0.20 cents per contract. But, of course, we have our 100-unit multiplier, so that means that Doug would pay $20 for the put and has secured the right to sell the shares at the uh, agreed-upon strike price. And Amy has collected $20 in income and has um, taken on an obligation to potentially have to buy the shares at that $22 strike price. And again, those rights and obligations are valid within the, um, within the um, one month or the time frame selected associated with the contract. Now, it's important to realize that, that there are many different um, contracts available. Um, so when you're looking at your trading platform and you're looking at the options chains, you will see that there are uh, a number of different expiration months and a number of different strike prices associated with um, the calls and the puts for any particular security. So it's really important to um, make sure that you step back and consider what uh, particular contract and what particular time frame and strike price make the most sense for whatever you're trying to accomplish. Now, we're going to cover these um, in great detail over uh, the next series of our webinars. But again, um, just make sure that you understand that it's about it's about selecting the appropriate strike price and expiration date uh, for the objectives that you're trying to um, that the objectives that you're trying to accomplish. So with that in mind, let's take a look um, at, a, um, at the different uh, um, uh, characteristics of an options contract, because there's two real, really important um, um, characteristics that we have to consider when we're purchasing or selling the contract to meet our objectives. So one, of course, is the strike price. You've already heard me mention. Uh, so the strike price, by definition, is the price at which the option buyer has the right to transact the security. And it's the price at which the option writer has the obligation to transact the security. The expiration month refers to the month in which the option expires. Now, uh, typically, the option contract, an option contract will expire the third Friday of the expiration month selected unless the stock has weekly options. Uh, so there are um, more highly traded uh, op or stocks that have weekly options available. Um, so again, these uh, these short term, short duration option contracts are only available on the most liquid options chains, and they're listed um, on Thursday uh, and expire the following Friday. And many people use these contracts for uh, short term income generation, or they'll use them to hedge out short term uh, market risks, maybe associated with a particular event such as an earnings report. Um, but there are some really um, important characteristics of weekly options that you need to understand. Again, we're going to cover these uh, in uh, upcoming webinars, but I want to make sure that you understand the characteristics of um, weekly options and, and how, you know, um, and how they trade um, uniquely comparative to the longer dated options before you go in and, and look at utilizing them. Uh, there's also uh, two different types of options uh, when it comes to um, the exercise and assignment or what we would refer to as settlement so um, the first is American style. Now, this is typically the um, the the most common uh, type of option that we would be looking at. Uh, almost all equity and exchange traded fund options are what we would refer to as American style. Um, what this means is that um, is that they can be exercised at any time uh, prior to the expiration date. Now, keep in mind it. it it's not a common practice to um, exercise an option contract early uh, because as the option buyer, uh, that means that I would be forfeiting the remaining time value in the option contract. So quite often, um, you know, these contracts are, are held um, uh, till expiration. Um, but uh, keep in mind, as the option writer, there is the obligation that you could be assigned to fulfill or there is the potential that you could be assigned to fulfill your obligation at um, at any point within the life cycle of the uh, of the contract. 
So just to give you a, uh, an example of what we mean by um, uh, options, exercise, and assignment. So let's go back and take a look at uh, Jackie, who originally bought the, uh, the contract for um, at the 105 strike price and paid $1.40 per contract or $140 based on that 100 unit multi multiplier. Um, and uh, let's say ABC proceeds to rally above the uh, 105 strike pr price into the expiration. Um, what Jackie could do is she could uh, sell the call at a profit. So that is, is one way to monetize the um, appreciation of the call. So if the underlying shares increase in value, uh, then Jackie could simply sell that call option at a, at a profit or um, she could exercise her, her right and take ownership of the stock at $105. So what that means is Jackie would pay the um, $105 per share, right, and give up the premium that she paid, and Peter would get assigned on the call that he sold, keep the premium collected, and subsequently deliver the shares. So uh, Peter has gotten paid to sell the shares that he felt uh, were already at a higher price, and Jackie now has taken possession of the shares um, uh, as a way to um, main, or as a way to obtain a shareholder stake in the position. So again, remember Jackie had two choices. She could either sell the call back to the market and um, and take advantage of the appreciation of the call based on the move higher in the underlying shares, or if she felt that she wanted to um, take possession of the underlying shares, she could exercise her right. And then subsequently, Peter gets assigned and then delivers the shares for that 105 um, at 105 dollars, which is the strike price that they uh, that they agreed upon. Now, one important consideration here as the call option buyer is if um, you are holding the contract um, on expiration and um, once the market closes, if the share value is one penny above the strike price in the case of the call option or one penny below the strike price in the case of the put option, it's considered to be in the money. So if you've held that contract through the expiration Friday and now the market's closed and they now have a settlement value on the uh, stock for the, for the day, then if the, the share price, once again, is one penny above the strike in the case of the call or one penny below the strike in the case of the put, it's considered to be in the money. And what that means is that um, the automatic exercise rule will be triggered. And um, the in Canada, the Canadian Derivatives Clearing Corporation assumes that you as the option holder wish to exercise um, your right and ultimately you will receive the underlying share. So keep in mind the, um, the dollar equivalent uh, in purchasing those underlying shares will come out of your account and the underlying shares at the strike price that you had purchased will come into your account. So it's important to understand that that automatic exercise rule will come into effect. Now you can um, uh, call your broker and you can ask them not to um, follow through with that. So there's ways that you can manage around that, or you could um, ultimately just close your options position before the end of the day to avoid it. But again, important to recognize that this is a um, this is an event that will take place if the options are in the money uh, on that expiration Friday after the uh, after the close. So everything that I've just discussed up until this point uh, is around the American style um, approach to um, settlement. The other approach to settlement is what we would refer to as European style. So most index options are European style. So um, in Canada, uh, trading on the Montreal Exchange, we have SXO options, which are options on the S&P TSX 60. Uh, we also have USX options, which are currency options, which uh, are trade based on the uh, traded based on the value of the U.S. dollar to the Canadian dollar. Now, because there is no underlying shares to exchange hands. Hands, um, these contracts are cash settled for the difference between the um, the uh, strike price and the settlement value of the underlying index or the underlying uh, currency pair. Uh, they can only be what we would call exercised on expiration, but it's not really 
um, in the true sense of the word being, you know, exercised because again, there's, there's only a cash settlement that takes place. Keep in mind, you can still buy and sell these options um, on the exchange right up until the expiration date. But the only difference between uh, buying and selling, uh, you know, ahead of expiration in terms of just the settlement is the fact that you are doing this, um, you know, at your own discretion, where if you held these contracts uh, through to the end of the expiration date and they happen to be in the money in the same uh, in the same way that we just discussed with the our, uh, with the American style, um, they would be just cash settled. So you wouldn't receive any underlying shares. You would simply just um, be credited or debited the, um, the, the difference between the uh, strike price associated with the option contract and the settlement value of the uh, of the underlying index or again uh, currency fair. So let's take a look at options pricing variables. Now, one of the things that makes the options market a little, market a little bit more challenging to uh, to to learn uh, are all of the different variables that um, are influencing the value of the contract uh, every minute of the day that the market is uh, is trading. But those unique characteristics uh, or unique pricing variables also make the options market one of the most um, uh, one of the most flexible. Uh, financial uh, security to to utilize. Uh, so once you understand um, how an option contract is priced and the different influences that are taking place, um, then you can build all sorts of different strategies to help manage risk, to help uh, to help generate cash flow, to um, you know take on a um, a position in an underlying shares with a reduced amount of uh, of uh, capital. So in other words, uh, you could leverage with a limited uh, and identifiable viable risk exposure. So um, important to understand all of these um, different variables because ultimately these are what you're going to build your, your strategies around when you're trying to take advantage of different opportunities within the, uh, within the market. So uh, the first uh, consideration in terms of how an option is priced is of course the price of, of the underlying security. So as, a, as the stock goes up and down in value, uh, the option contract will move up and down in, in value as well relative to um, its strike price relative to its expiration date and relative to whether or not it's a call option or a put option. Um, second of that is again the strike price of the option contract. So how close is the strike price that you've selected uh, to the um, price of the underlying security? Because the closer the strike price is of the option, the more heavily influenced that um, that uh, contract will be when the stock moves up or down. And we cover these uh, uh, a little bit more in detail when we present on options uh, Greeks, which are the, the, the different mathematical applications to um, how an option is priced. But again, price of the underlying, strike price of the option. Time until expiration, uh, we're going to touch on this here in a little bit more detail in, in a couple of minutes, but just a simple rule of thumb is to remember that the more time uh, that you uh, purchase until expiration, so the longer date of the option contract, the, um, the more expensive the, the option contract is going to be. Uh, volatility of the underlying, so how fast and how significant is the underlying stock moving uh, comparative to its average price. So the more volatile the stock, uh, typically the more expensive the, uh, the option contract is going to be. And that has to do with you know the risk associated with the stock and also the uncertainties associated with the, uh, with the stock. The um, next is the dividends. So it's important to understand that all dividends are factored in uh, to the option price. Uh, whether it's a call or a put option. So understand that it is only the shareholder on record that gets to collect the dividend. Um, when you buy a call option, it may be a stock replacement strategy in the, in the sense that you are assuming a bullish position in the underlying security. And yes, you um, have assumed uh, the right to own the underlying security at a specific price, but you don't get paid the dividend. Uh, and finally, the um, uh, the risk free rate of interest as well. So there is an equation that um, that uh, all of these variables are um, priced in or factored into, and then ultimately these um, these equations influence what's referred to as the theoretical value of the option contract. And it is that theoretical value of the option contract that um, is uh, posted, and then the market forces, uh, you know, the supply and demand factors influence the value of the contract uh, to make a market.
So let's um, dig a little bit more uh, deeply into the strike price and its relationship to the um, the underlying stock price. So uh, I mentioned that as a stock is moving higher or lower, the option can move above and below um, um, the uh, the strike price um, or the stock as the stock moves above. Um, and below the strike price, the category of the option contract changes. So there are actually three main categories that um, that we um, consider when relating the strike price to the stock price. So there's an in the money option, which we've kind of already touched on. Um, there's the at the money option contract and there's the out of the money option. So these are sort of very general. So in other words, you're going to see that there are many different contracts that will fall within each of these three categories. And throughout the day, depending upon um, how the underlying security is trading, the option contract will move from in the money to at the money to out of the money. And as a um, as an options trader or as an investor looking to utilize options, um, each of these uh, different categories in general has their own uh, advantages and uh, and disadvantages, which again we'll discuss in uh, in more detail at a later webinar. Um, so in order to sort of understand um, in the money, at the money, out of the money, we've got to first. Uh, understand the different components of an option contract when it comes to uh, how they're priced. So um, the first is really understanding what we mean by intrinsic value, right? So intrinsic value uh, is determined by taking the current stock price for the call option uh, and subtracting the strike price. And, um, and the amount by which the option is in the money, so in other words, uh, if the stock is at, um, at 20 and the strike is, um, is uh, 15, then that call option would be considered to be in the money by $5. Uh, if the um, put, for example, we take the strike price minus the current stock price, if the strike price, let's say, is 20, but the current stock price is 15, then again, that put would be considered to be in the money by $5, All right? So, and remember, it is um, an in the money option on expiration um, where there is the potential to, um, to uh, um, have to deal with the automatic exercise rule. So, beyond the intrinsic value, is time value because not all options have intrinsic value. So there has to be some other variable or some other component that's making up the uh, the premium of the option contract. Well, that's where the time value comes in. So um, to determine the time value of an option contract, you take the option premium, you subtract the intrinsic value and you get the time value, right? If the option contract has no intrinsic value, then it stands to reason that um, it is made up entirely of time important to understand that time value erodes to zero by expiration, right? So that, that works very well for the option writer because the intention is to sell the option, collect the premium, and ideally um, the premium goes to zero and you, um, you keep what you've collected. But as the option buyer, um, that means that you have a limited amount of time to you know, for the stock to do what you anticipate it doing, um, and you need to manage uh, accordingly because if the stock is not in the money, um, or sorry, if the option contract is not in the money on expiration, um, then there's no intrinsic value and um, there's no time value, which means the option contract will be worth nothing. It'll expire worthless. So let's talk a little bit more about the impact of time. So the more time until expiration, the higher the premium. We gotta recognize that time uh, time value is a function of unpredictability. So in other words, um, if I was looking at, you know, predicting the, um, you know, how, how a stock is going to behave uh, between now and the end of the week, um, I could factor in maybe an earnings report, maybe some sort of a, a, a central bank announcement. Uh, I could look at, you know, sort of the real near term market risks and I could make a, a reasonable forecast as to where that stock is going to be by, by Friday, uh, either up so much or down so much. But the challenge is, um, you know, the longer time, uh, you know, the longer the time horizon, the more challenging it is to uh, factor in. Uh, the different variables and so because of that um, you know the the more time um, allotted to an option contract uh, the um, the more expensive it's going to be now recognize in reverse 
Um, as, as we get closer to expiration, um, uncertainty decreases. And as a result, the option contract starts to lose value more and more and more until we get to that expiration date. And if there hasn't been a move in the underlying security, all the time value is gone. And once again, as I mentioned in the last slide, um, the uh, option will expire worthless. So um, touching on, um, on just how to sort of, um, once again, calculate uh, time value versus intrinsic value, let's again take a look at uh, a stock that's trading at $20 and the option contract may be listed at $6.50. Um, so the stock is $20. We've got a 15 strike call option. Uh, that has an intrinsic, meaning that it has an intrinsic value of $5. So again, um, with the call trading at $6.50, we know that $1.50 of that is time value and $5 of that is intrinsic value. So um, this option contract is $5 in the money and it has so $5 of intrinsic value. $1.50 in time value. Now, if the stock stayed the same from now until expiration, all of this time value would be gone and you would be left with just intrinsic value. If the stock dropped in value and was trading all the way down at 15 come expiration, well, there's no intrinsic value, you've lost all time value and subsequently the option contract will expire worthless. So very important to understand as the option buyer um, that you need to manage your risk uh, as you move towards expiration it, you know, it, either locking in profits if it's a stock replacement strategy or um, cutting losses if you find that the stock has gone against you, um, recognizing that um, if you hold until expiration and the um, stock price is below, in this case, the strike price of 15, option will be worth nothing. If we take a look at how that's calculated um, for a put option, we'll look at a stock at $20. Um, and we'll consider a 25 strike put option, which has an intrinsic value of five. Again, I kind of gave a little bit of an example of this earlier on. How do we determine that? Well, if we go to the options market and we look at the $5.95 premium, right? We know that if we take 25, which is the strike, minus 20, which is the stock, we've got a $5 intrinsic value. So we subtract that $5 of intrinsic value from the 5.95, and we can see that there is 95 cents of decay time value. Right. And again, um, if the stock stays unchanged between now and expiration, then all of the time value will be gone and you'll be left with the intrinsic value. If in this case, the stock goes up in value and trades towards 25, you begin to lose intrinsic value. If the stock is at 20, um, 25 on expiration with a 25 strike price, there's no intrinsic value. There's no time value. And you get an option contract that is um, going to expire worthless. So again, time value erodes to zero as an option approaches expiration. Great for the option writer, but needs to be managed very closely for the option buyer. Um, the intrinsic value reflects the real value of the option contract and, and does not erode with time. So remember, it does um, fluctuate as the underlying shares move up and down in value um, because the intrinsic value is directly rate, related to the value of the, uh, of the underlying security. Um, so this is just a uh, sort of a, a, a bit of a generic example of how um, the time value uh, depreciation would work. So the longer you give yourself, um, yes, you're going to pay more for the contract, but recognize that the time depreciation is, um, is less um, aggressive and it starts to get more and more aggressive, for lack of a better word, um, as you move towards expiration, in which case in the last week of the options life, that time decay is very, very quick. So that circles back to sort of understanding a little bit more of the characteristics of an, a weekly option because the time depreciation factor is, uh, is very, very aggressive during that, um, during that last week. And, and again, you need to manage, uh, manage accordingly. So to reinforce once again, um, for uh, options expiration, um, options uh, for the most part will expire the third Friday of the expiration month selected. Uh, again, some stocks and exchange traded funds have weekly options, but those are usually stocks that are much, um, you know, have a, have, um, 
uh, have uh, a lot of liquidity, are, are very highly traded. So in other words, you know, the more people that are buying and selling the uh, shares of the underlying security, the, the more liquid the options market is and the more likely that there's going to be weekly options associated with those contracts that you can just um, consider when you are looking at what strategy makes the most sense to meet a particular um, objective. Um, the settlement value for um, equity uh, and exchange traded fund options is based on the closing price of the stock at 4 p.m. Eastern time uh, on that uh, on that expiration Friday. So again, that's important information when when looking at a call or a put option that might uh, have a um, uh, an intrinsic value because if you're still holding that position at 4 p.m. Um, on the expiration Friday and there is an intrinsic value, uh, then you um, are going to be automatically, or that option will be automatically exercised on your behalf uh, if you haven't already taken the steps with your broker to ensure that that uh, doesn't happen. So again, lots of little, um, uh, lots of little details that you need to keep in mind. Uh, this information, of course, that I've just presented here provides uh, a great foundation uh, for you to get started in, in sort of understanding how. Um, you know, in options uh, contract trades. Of course, in our upcoming webinars, uh, we're going to be sharing a number of different um, approaches to utilizing these, um, you know, the, these different option contracts to meet specific objectives, such as, you know, stock replacement strategies for bullish and bearish uh, markets, uh, income generation, hedging strategies, um, and, uh, and so on. Uh, in the meantime, um, there's lots of, uh, of tools uh, at your disposal that, uh, at your disposal that are available through the Montreal Exchange. Of course, we have uh, our blogs that we post at optionmatters.ca. Uh, there are lots of different um, um, investor letters that you can access, videos and webinars, trading guides and strategies, option calculators, covered call calculators, great little options trading simulator available at m-x.ca as well, as well as a really uh, a cool screening tool called Options Play that you can access uh, on the Montreal Exchange site as well. So again, for more information, please visit uh, www.m-x.ca. Uh, if you're looking for more videos and webinars um, in, in association with these ones that uh, we've made available here, um, the, you can go to m-x.tv. Thanks very much for joining.